We're in Philippians chapter 1. And uh, we've covered quite a bit of territory. Last week we covered a lot of territory, but we covered it uh, probably not as, as uh, in detail that we could have covered it. And so I just, what I want to do, because I have so much going on in my heart, and, uh, and I haven't really come to a conclusion of exactly where I should go, I'm going to read the verses, because typically when I start reading the verses, that which the Lord wants to put his finger on will just strike me in my heart. And so we, we begin in verse 1, Paul and Timothy, the bondservants of Jesus Christ. Isn't that precious? Are you a bondservant? You don't have to be Paul or Timothy to be a bondservant. A bondservant is someone who chooses to serve, not because they have to, not because they got to, not because they're supposed to, but because there's no other alternative for them. As far as they're concerned, being your servant, being your slave, serving every one of your interests and all of your concerns is the greatest thing than I could ever imagine. Now that ought to be true about all of us. And we all know in this life that there's many things that try to hinder that. I know in my life there's a lot of things that hinder it. You say, what could be in your life, Pastor, to hinder that? Just those everyday casual things that my natural self likes. Nothing sinful. Nothing worldly. Just those natural things of life that you like. Your natural likes can get in front of the things that you really love. You stop and think about us, each of us. I look across the congregation and I see some of us are married, some of us are single. But those that are single, you at least know what it's like to have a dear relationship with maybe a friend, with someone that you care about. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a brother or sister. But at least in a marriage relationship, you can remember those moments when you felt those great feelings of love and, and boy, I really want to spend the rest of my life with you. You remember those things. You remember those words that were spoken softly back and forth to each other. And then you're married and there's a great expression of that. But then as you go along, you find that those expressions come into contest with so many different things, disagreements, arguments. Uh, desires clash different things clash things get in the way and sometimes those expressions of love are not spoken perhaps as they once were when you're a bond servant there's no room for those things and I know in my life my natural likes have gotten in the way of me being a bond servant and so it's a good verse of scripture to kind of test yourself and look at yourself and examine yourself. Has that happened to me? Has that happened to me? When I first came to Christ, it was as though I was his bond servant. But as I go along in life, the natural things of life seem to stand up and say, well, what about me? Have you ever had that happen to you? If you're a human being, just a little while, you've had that happen to you. Now say, Pastor, why are you talking about these things? Because I'm a pastor and this is a pastoral teaching. Philippians is application. It's time to take, take time. We're not really discussing the deep doctrines that we discussed in Romans chapter 8. But because of those great doctrines we discussed in Romans chapter 8, we discovered that we were chosen before time. That we were handpicked by God. That... that he assigned that our destiny should be a new humanity that would forever throughout eternity be our single purpose would be to bring glory and honor to Christ. And as a result of that, he called us, he justified us. And in his mind, he already glorified us. And you and I had nothing whatsoever to do about that. So we stop and reflect upon what God has done. How he sent his son, how he offered up his life. How he answered the law that was condemning us and damning us. How he answered it, fulfilled it. And how he gave us his righteousness. How he justified us by the shedding of his blood. When you think of the enormity of God. And 
of his mercies displayed towards you and I. Then we look at Paul and Silas when he says here, or Paul and Timothy, Paul and Timothy bond servants, bond servants. These are two individuals that really grasped those great truths that you and I looked upon there for a season in the book of Romans. And they weren't something to them that was just something to know, something to learn, something to listen to. It was something that got down into their spiritual DNA and transformed them to the point that they became bond servants. I hope you know, I hope you understand, not everyone who's called by God to be a teacher or preacher has made themselves a bond servant. God doesn't make you a bond servant. You make yourself a bond servant. You see this one that you're serving and you see that he is so worthy of everything about your life and that nothing about your life, even the, the things that you like and the things that I like, those natural things, those things are totally legitimate, not one single thing wrong with them, are never to stand up and get in the way of him. Moms, have you ever felt like perhaps you weren't appreciated so much for what you do? Have you ever felt that way by your husband? Have you ever felt that way by your kids? Dads, have you ever felt that way? Friends, have you felt that maybe your friend overlooked you a little bit? We all know what it's like to be overlooked. You, you, you can't be here today and say to yourself, I don't understand what you're talking about. In my life, you know, I talked to Jill, I think, and Dana about this a few weeks back. You know, when you get to our age and your kids are growing up and they're going off to college, next thing you know, they get married and then you find out you're like my mom. You're being moved out to that outer realm of life. And before everything centered around you and everything was about you and your husband and your, and your marriage and your, and your children. And now it uh, seems like everything's on their timetable. And then it seems like the grandchildren on their timetable. Went to see Grant play football Sunday and, or Friday night. You know, we waited for the rain to stop. We went over there and watched a great game. And there's the grandchildren sitting right there. Didn't even say hello to us until it dawned on them. Papa and Nana are here. So caught up with their lives, so caught up with their friends. Do they love me? And, yes. Yes. But did the natural side of life and the things that, they were, that inundated them, did that kind of take precedence over us? Yeah, it did. Now, if, uh, has that ever happened in your life towards your parents? It has. Has that ever happened in your life towards your grandparents? It has. Do you think that could ever happen between you and the Lord? It has already. And so we talk about those things when we come to church. We look at those things. We don't look at those things to condemn ourselves. We look at those things to check ourselves. And we bow our heads when we hear those things and we say, Oh, Lord, I'm sorry that it's true. Have mercy on me. And renew in me again a passion that ought to be there, the desire that ought to be there. Renew it inside my soul again. Don't let me be drifting in my thoughts, in my hearts, in my affections, where you're concerned. Sometimes I like to just talk to my kids about this, but it doesn't work. Sometimes I like to talk to my grandkids about it, and it doesn't really work. It comes across as though you're condemning them. That's how it comes across. And as your pastor, I'm not condemning anybody because what I'm talking about is totally true about myself. And uh, of course, I always feel ashamed that it's true about me. But I've come to realize, though I'm a new creation in Christ, I'm not a new creation in life. What do you mean by that? I'm still a fallen person. You're still a fallen person. And fallen people need to be reminded about things. Every new creation is a fallen person in a fallen world with all these things around them, and we all need to be reminded about these things, because if we're never reminded about these things, we're never checked up on these things, and we never, we never turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I am what I am by the grace of God, and I need to be what I need to be by the grace of God. May there be more grace in my life to help me. Can you say amen? amen. Then he says, in that context... To all the saints in Christ Jesus. Now we know we're saints in Christ Jesus because we've been called by God. That's what constitutes you a saint. He talks and he addresses the bishops and the, and the deacons as well. But notice, he doesn't address them before he addresses the saints. 
In other words, just because you got some position in church doesn't mean that you're in a greater position than a saint. The saint is the greatest position there is. And then he goes on to say, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace always comes from God our Father, but not without the Lord Jesus Christ. If it were not for his sacrifice, no grace and peace could ever come to you or me. So we're reminded of that in that particular verse. He goes on and he says, I thank God in verse 3. Upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine. Now that ought to be something that's true of all of us. That every time we come across one another's mind, that we give thanks upon every remembrance. Giving thanks, what's that mean? I think Joe and Annie pops in my head, Lord, thank God for Joe and Annie. Thank God for the life, their lives. Thank God for what you're doing in their lives. Thank God. You thank God. You're giving thanks. It keeps you. It keeps you in remembrance of those in an intelligent way. Always giving, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy. For your fellowship of the gospel from the first day. He's giving thanks because from the very first time he, we read that in Acts chapter 16, that he came and preached the gospel to, the, to Lydia, to the Philippian jailer, to his household, and to others, that there was a fellowship with the gospel. Now he's mentioning the word gospel. The gospel is a big thing in the Apostle Paul's life. It was a big thing in the church at Philippi. It's that very thing that Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes. What he means by that is the gospel never fails. There's power in the gospel to transform lives, to bring salvation. And it's the only the gospel that can do that. And he's thinking that at every remembrance that they have fellowship in the gospel, that the Philippians were there to support him. And even in prison, you'll find out when you get to chapter three, I think it is, that, that there's uh, comments made about the gift that they sent to Paul. And he says, being confident. And this is, this is one of the things that he's... he's uh, uh, in the context of him giving thanks, in the context of him with joy praying for them. In that context, he wants to encourage them of something that he knows to be true about them. And that is this, that I'm confident that he that began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now he's confident, and all Christians can be confident of this, because Paul has a clear grasp of the gospel. They have a clear grasp of the gospel. They can be confident of it as well. And this is something that you can use to test your Christian profession. Every Christian, every person who professes Christ has experienced and is experiencing two things. They have experienced God beginning a good work. They can recall... There was a time in their life when that good work began. They didn't know it was a new birth. They didn't know it was an awakening. They didn't know it was God's spirit moving at the time. But as they look back, they look back at it and they see how God began a good work and brought them to a place of repentance where they had a change of mind about Christ, a change of mind about themselves, a change of mind about Christ, and they were brought to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. They know they experienced that. The experience is different with everybody, but they know they experienced that. And they also experience in their day-to-day -day Christian life, they know that God's at work within them. They sense and see God's work in their life. They see it in their marriage. They see it in their family. They see it in the workplace. They see it in, their, in, their, in themselves, personally. They see it. Paul had seen it. He had witnessed to it. And he was so confident that what he has seen will continue and then one day be completed at the day of Christ. 
And that's where Paul begins to give out hints that his ministry and is to prepare them for that day of Christ. And, and every Christian needs to realize that this continual work that God's doing in your life, he will complete it on the day of Christ, but that also tells you that he's at work within you, meaning that that's his preparation. Everyone in this room is being prepared to stand before Christ one day. Well, I thought now that I'm saved, I'm just already prepared. Well, you're, you're, you're prepared in the sense that you've been justified by faith. But see, you're running a race. And in running this race, Paul doesn't want you tripping and stumbling and falling over. He wants you to finish this race with joy as he wants to finish it. We read that in Acts chapter 20. And so he's, he, he, he's reflecting here. He's reminding us of in that statement that we're all in preparation for a great day that's ahead. He says in verse 7, just as it is right, for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. Isn't that wonderful? I have you in my heart. That is the way every minister ought to be. If the people are not in the minister's heart, the minister ceases to minister to them. I'm so sad to tell you how I hear people talk about, ministers talk about people. He doesn't talk about, they don't, some, some don't talk about their congregations like um, Paul did. I could tell you stories. I won't even bother telling you the stories. They're not very edifying. If you're ministered to by me, it's a sign that you're in my heart. If you receive ministry, you receive help, you receive strength, you receive those occasional rebukes and rebuffs, well, you know you're in my heart. Just as it's right for me to think this of you because I have you in my heart, Inasmuch as both in my chains and defense and the confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me. So now he's talking about his defense and confirmation of the gospel. And he's talking about them being partakers with him in the defense, in the confirmation of the gospel. That's pretty important. What's the defense of the gospel? Ever thought about what that means? What does it mean to defend the gospel? Well, what do you do when someone hauls you into a court and accuses you of something falsely? What do you do? You defend yourself. That's what this word means. You defend, you're defending what's true. Look at Jude chapter 3. Jude chapter 3. Jude verse 3, I should say. <laughs> Got it up there, Rob? For God is my witness... Oh, wait a second. Jude 3. Jude. Okay, Jude 1, 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation. Now think about that verse right there. Is he talking to preachers right here in Jude? He says in Jude 1, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James. So he's a bondservant too. It's good to be a bondservant. You know, to say that you're a bondservant is a big statement. I wonder if we can say I'm a bondservant. Can we say that? Can we say that? Can we say that? To those who are called, sanctified, by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied unto you. So it's he's not addressing a, a group of preachers right here, is he? Is he? No, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. He's talking to the saints, right? Remember what, hold on there. Remember what Paul said back here in Philippians? 
He says, I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. Now, we're all partakers of grace because we're in Christ Jesus, but as we're partakers of that grace, we're busy doing something. We're de busy defending the gospel and the confirmation of the gospel. The defending of the gospel means, like I said earlier, you defend the truth of the gospel. Doesn't mean we're looking for arguments. Doesn't, look like we're, doesn't mean we're looking for disputes. But when some preacher stands up, teaches and preaches something that's wrong, we're not to say, well, he's nice and he's friendly and he smiles brightly and he's a good person. Well, what he just did was wrong. And so the gospel needs to be defended at that point. The confirmation of the gospel simply means a clear explanation of the gospel. That's all it means. Clear explanation of the gospel. That means that when we talk to people about Christ, we don't say, well, you really need the Lord. That's unclear. Well, you need to ask Jesus in your heart. That's unclear. You really need to give yourself to the Lord. That's unclear. That's not gospel. So saints need to be clear about what the gospel is if they're going to defend it. And they need to be clear about what the gospel is if they're going to proclaim it. How in the world are you going to defend something you don't understand or, or proclaim something you're not clear about? Now, do you folks, uh, I'll get back to Jude here. Hang on. But do you folks remember a while back, years ago, when we were over there in the Lifetime Center, we introduced uh, Step Up to Life? I don't know how everybody, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but I had a lot of flack on that. I'm not going to do it that way. I got my own way. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do it that way. Well, all I was trying to introduce to everybody, the only thing I was trying to introduce, I wasn't trying to say this is what you have to do. All I was trying to introduce back then is that there's a lot of people that don't know they're lost. And that step up to life showed you that, that truth. And so the idea, if you're just going to say people need the Lord, you need the Lord in your life, uh, or, or say God bless you like you felt like you shared the gospel by saying God bless you somebody, we're falling far short, everyone. And that's all I was really trying to do. And some people feel like you got to take them back to the garden, talk about Adam's fall and go all through the whole thing. You really don't have to do that. But we do need to understand the gospel if we're going to defend it. Now, I can mention preachers' names, but I won't do that right now. But there's one that's very, very popular. And when you listen to this person preach and teach, he doesn't teach and preach Christ. He teaches and preaches humanistic psychology. Uh, with, it's all littered with uh, verses of Scripture. And people are shouting, crying, jumping, dancing, and it's not even the truth. So does that tell me something? The people that are doing all of that, responding that way, they don't have a clue what the gospel is, do they? They, they have grown up in that atmosphere and they just kind of think, well, that, that's the gospel, that's the truth. After all, grandpa gets excited about it, mom and dad get excited about it, my friends get excited about it, I should be getting excited about it. So they start drinking it in. Remember when we were Catholics? We thought penance was the gospel. We thought confession was the gospel. We thought the mass was the gospel. We thought all these things were the truth. Remember that? Well, we were wrong, weren't we? So we need to know what the truth is. And so he says to the saints, he's not talking to preachers. Jews not saying, this is a bondservant now, folks. This is someone who has no interest but Christ. Okay? And he's talking to those that are called by God, sanctified by God, preserved in Christ Jesus, He's talking to you and me as though he was standing right here in front of us talking to us. He's saying that mercy, peace, and love, be, uh, and love be multiplied into you. He's on our team. He's on our side. He has our best interests at heart. And he says, verse 3, beloved. That's a nice way to approach us, isn't it? Beloved. Those that I care for. Those that are in my heart. Beloved. While I was... While I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary, necessary to write to you, exhorting you 
to contend earnestly. Now, contend, he could have said contend for the faith. Contend. But then he said, contend earnestly. It's kind of like he wakes you up. Whoa, earnestly. You know what earnest means, don't you? That means, wow, wake up. This is important. This, you need to be vigilant. This is a, an extremely important matter. I felt it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered unto you. Now, the faith which was once delivered unto you, do you know what that means in a nutshell? In a nutshell, in one word, it's the gospel. If you open up that nutshell and go inside that nutshell, it means this. That you and I are under the wrath of God because we have transgressed his law. We're transgressors. God so loved us that transgressed his law that he sent his son. Born of a woman in order to represent us. Brought a new Adam into being. God became flesh. He was born under the law to answer the law, to fulfill the law, to satisfy the law. So the law would have no voice of condemnation for you or for me ever again. So what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, can be the song of your heart. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. He went to the cross, he paid the price, wounded and for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. They placed him in a grave and God raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand. We believe in that God who sent him. We believe in his son who did what he did. We believe that Jesus Christ satisfied the law. We believe the law has no condemnation for us, but it does have condemnation for our neighbors. It does for our sons and our daughters and our grandchildren and our parents and all the people around us, the circle of people that we love and know. And if we're going to proclaim the gospel to them, we can't say, ask Jesus in your heart. Let me stop and pause here for a second. You know my testimony, so I won't take time to share it. But you do recall that I told you about Dave Witter witnessing to me. When Dave Witter witnessed to me and he told me his experience, when I went to my car that night to say that prayer, I was looking for Dave Witter's experience. Dave Witter never told me. Now, I'm not saying nothing bad about Dave. He gave me tracts to read and what have you. But there was nothing he told me that I was a sinner. Oh, he told me that I was a sinner. But, you know, the Catholics told me I was a sinner. But a sinner would be like having a cold, having a flu. I mean, something just wasn't something just wasn't right, but you could live with it. That's all it was. It's not a problem. It wasn't anything dangerous. Didn't put my feet in hell or anything. So when I said my prayers, sincerely as you ever heard anybody say, Oh dear God, I want to be a Christian like that man named Dave Witter. Will you please forgive my sins and come into my heart and save me and make me a Christian tonight? About what I said. Thought about it, sat there. Now they ain't nothing to this. And I went on home. You know the rest of the story. Listen to me, everyone. Most evangelical churches in every community in America, that is their gospel message. God will change you. God will transform you. God will do these things for you. God will do that for you. God will bless you. God will make your life different. He'll give you purpose. He will do all these wonderful things for you. And you're thinking, well, I'm a Presbyterian. I'm an a Episcopalian. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Assembly of God. I'm this. I'm that. You know, I've said a lot of prayers and done a lot of things and received a lot of sacraments. I just don't know if I've ever gotten that yet. Maybe So you say this prayer and that's what happens. And then people think that they become Christians that way. I'll tell you what you become. You take upon yourself the culture of present day Christianity. But you don't take unto yourself the biblical culture of the Christianity of the Bible. Because the biblical Christianity of the Bible is someone that by God's spirit discovers what they are. 
in the face of Jesus Christ. And it causes them to change their mind about how they see themselves, how they view themselves, and how they view Christ. They find themselves coming to Christ. Now, if what I'm saying is true, and I believe it is, what do you think is actually happening in the majority of evangelical churches when these people come out of these different churches, friends are inviting them to these churches, and they're coming into these churches, and they are saying this prayer, because after all, you want purpose in your life. If you want purpose in your life, raise your hand. Who wants purpose? Purpose. Who would like to be successful in life? Would you like to be successful? Raise your hand. Yes, I'm in line. Would you like to have peace and joy? I heard you say that one time. Peace and joy. Happiness, right? Raise your hand. Okay. If you say this prayer with me, I'll pray with you. You come forward here tonight, and this is what will happen. This is what's actually happening in America today. This is what's happening in our community today. This is what's happening. Do you think all these people are actually becoming Christians? They're taking on the culture of present-day Christianity. The Apostle Paul says, I am set for the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. And you're partakers of me in this grace. Right. Know, what he's saying with, know what he's saying by this? And you are partakers with me in this grace. He is saying this is the function of the church. He is saying this is the function of every Christian. This is the function of every follower of Christ. Now, if you, have, if you tell yourself, are, is this a Christian church? I, I hope it is. It's our name. Grace Christian. Are you a Christian? Okay. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, do you know, according to the word of God, that you are a partaker of grace, both for the defense and the confirmation of the gospel? In other words, the church is called to these two things. You want to know, what are we called to do as a church? What's our vision? You ever hear that kind of stuff? What's our vision? What's our mission? It's twofold. The defense and the confirmation of the gospel. That's why your pastor has to be an individual that throughout when he teaches and preaches, he's going to teach and preach and he's going to make mention of things that are going on in the church today that are not correct. What's he doing? He's defending the gospel. What else is he doing? He's preparing you to defend the gospel. That's right, amen. And when he's teaching and preaching and explaining the gospel and repeating it again and again and trying to make it clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer, what's he doing? He's preparing you for the confirmation of the gospel. So you can defend it and you can confirm it. Can you say amen? It says in Jude... Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning your common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly. Let your heart be in it. Let your soul be in it. Let your mind be in it. Let your hands and feet be in it. Let your money be in it. Let, your, let everything about yourself be in it. Contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered you. In other words, if you're not going to contend for the faith, then it's going to be destroyed. Thank God for the reformers. Thank God for all the Christians that have, gone be, be, uh, that have gone ahead of us that have defended and preserved the gospel or you wouldn't have it. And I'm here to tell you, you're not a popular preacher when you're a defender of the gospel. And you're not a popular preacher if you're for the confirmation of the gospel. What do you mean, Pastor? We like you. You're okay with us. Yeah, because you're a defender. In a, you're a defender of the gospel. You confirm the gospel. This is in your heart. Perhaps you not have been earnestly contending for it like maybe you ought to, but it's in your heart. You don't have no problem with it. But the gospel is very offensive. The gospel says everything about your life is wrong. The gospel says you're under the condemnation of God's wrath. The gospel says that Christ had to die for. Your transgressions, your transgressions had, are leaving you guilty before God. The law is condemning you. Christ had to come and intervene for you. The Pope can't intervene for you. Your church can't intervene for you. You can't intervene for yourself. The saints can't intervene for you. And you start expl you're condemning, you're, you're, you're defending the faith there. As in the same context, you're, 
the confirmation of the gospel. And when you start telling people these things, well, that means grandma and grandpa aren't saved. Well, that means this one's not saved. That means that. That means this. That means people are in hell. That means this. That means the other thing. And all of a sudden, no one likes what you have to say. Why do you think they persecuted the early church? Why do you think they persecuted them? They persecuted them not because what they were as a person. They persecuted them because of their message, because of what they believed. When you go to Athens 17, when it talks about how they had all these different gods, that's all these Greek philosophers had all these different gods and what have you, and they were all saying, well, what is this Christian faith you have? Huh? 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 What's the basis of this? Huh? What, what is the foundation for what you're saying? Well, 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 I think you need to add this. You need to add this. You need to add this with it as well, if it's really going to be what it ought to be. Paul says, you start adding to this, there's no gospel at all. So he had to defend it. What do you think he's in prison for? Defending the gospel. The gospel is offensive. Very offensive. If you share the gospel crisp and clear with somebody, now Ray Comfort does a very good job, and he does it with winsomeness. And he does real well. People thank him for what he had to say. But if you watch a lot of his programs, you find out that people get upset with him. People are offended with him. It's how you do it. You need to do what you do in defending the gospel in a winsome way. And some of us have watched some of these videos, these guys standing on the, on the street corner ho hollering and shouting and yelling at these people and saying this and that to them. You know, if God wants me to do that, I guess so. But, you know, to me, that seems like you're driving people away. You're just driving people away. There's a way you need to do things in such a way that, that you're communicating with people. You're trying to communicate with them. And um, other people would argue and say, well, that's what God led them to do. Well, perhaps he did. I'm not going to challenge that. But some of it, it can be to the point that you just feel sorry for the person who's doing it because he looks like he's defeating his purpose. There's a way to defend the gospel, and there's a way not to defend the gospel. He goes on in verse 4, and he says, For certain men, this is Jude verse 4, he says, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who were long ago marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness, denying the only Lord God and Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, all these different ways that people teach and preach and say things about Christ actually turns out to be a denial, a denial of Christ. And Paul says, no, we need to be for the defense of the gospel. We need to be for the confirmation of the gospel. So it's quarter two, and I need to, I need to end right here. There's a lot more to say to you, but I'll just go ahead and end right here. And I want to ask you this question today. Do you understand the gospel? Do you understand it? Do you know that it's more than asking Jesus in your heart? Do you know it's more than saying, God bless you? Do you know it's more than saying, you really need the Lord in your life? Do you understand that the people you and I love are under the condemnation of God's law? They're underneath the wrath of God. Do you understand that God has a remedy? He sent his son. Do you understand that it's our job to defend the gospel and to proclaim the truth of the gospel? It's not difficult. It's not difficult. What have you done? What have you done with Christ? What do you understand about Christ when you talk to people? What do you understand about Christ? What do you understand about Christ, why he came? What do you understand about his death? What do you understand about his sacrifice? What, what do you understand why it was necessary? Why it was needed? Why it was required? Why didn't God do it some other way? And all these people, nobody's going to know what to say. Well, they're, they're, but they're kind of intrigued. Say it's because all of us are under the condemnation of God's law. 
Say, for this reason, God sent his son in due time he came, born of a woman, born under the law. Why? He had to satisfy that law. He had to answer that law, otherwise you and I were going to answer it. Do you know what the law is? Then you take them, you share the law with them. The law tells us, thou shalt not covet. Have you ever coveted? Have you ever, have you ever looked to lust? Have you ever desired to have something? You never stole it, but you desired to. Have you ever lied or even thought about lying? Because God doesn't judge you according to your outward actions. God judges you according to the act your outward actions, the actions of your mind, the actions of your thoughts, the actions of your desires, the actions of your inward wishes. That's what he does. That leaves us all in big trouble, doesn't it? Even as Christians. Far as recognizing that we are sinners. But, thank God as Christians, our perfections before Almighty God are never to be found in us, but they're always found in Christ. Can you say amen, everybody?